I think what helps me a lot when I'm trying to write a book, trying to imagine a book, is, is to know the places I'm writing about really, really well. And it's not an accident, therefore, that I've used my home village, this village of Iddesley, very often in my books. I don't think, I'm not a very imaginative writer. I could not possibly in a million years write fantasy. I just can't do that. I need to be rooted in, in reality. And this is my reality. This is my place. And I know the names of the people on that war memorial. I know where they lived. I know what families they came from. They mean something to me. I know some of their relations. And I met some of the survivors from that war. So time and time again, when i wanting to set a story, I do come back here, so with Warhorse, yes, it starts here and indeed it ends here. Well, the beginning of Warhorse, it really started with the um, discovery that we had, given from my father-in-law, uh, four pictures, watercolour pictures, done by a man called F.W. Reed during the First World War for the Illustrated London News, and they were contemporary pictures of British cavalry charging uh, during the First World War, and one particular picture was of horses being caught up in barbed wire as they charged a German position. So that was what in the first place gave me the, the notion to begin this story, begin thinking about the story. The writing process began as it, as it always does with me, with not writing at all, which is doing a lot of research, reading around the subject a lot, visits to the Imperial War Museum, um, and most importantly of all, finding the voice for the story. And in this particular case, it was really important to me to find the voice of the horse because I wanted this to be the story of the First World War, the story of the universal suffering during that war on all sides and by civilians who were in the middle of it all. And I knew in my heart the right way to do that was to um, tell the story from the horse's point of view. The horse hears uh, the conversations that the soldiers speak to the horse, so that the following of the horse and the following of the the deaths very often of the people that he lives with and who work with him and who use him are done through the horse's eyes right the way through. And indeed, the fellow suffering of his his horse friends as well. Quite accidentally, I, I'd already really started writing the book, got going, found the voice, I thought, and I got lucky. You have to get lucky writing a book. And I came across, it was a picture of a racehorse dated 1877, a winner of a race in Nottingham. Not a great picture, but a pleasant picture. And it was of a horse looking out of the canvas at me. As, and I looked back at him and I thought, I do want that picture. And I wanted it particularly because I thought I could model at least either on my main character horse or another one on this picture. And there was the name Topthorn. It wasn't Joey, it was Topthorn. And I bought this picture and very much modelled Topthorn on, on this picture. But also, more importantly, um, I decided then to begin my story with this picture which hangs in the hall, in Iddesley Village Hall. And I told a little lie, which fiction writers very often do. I said it was a picture of Joey and I said it hangs in the Village Hall and it doesn't hang in the village hall, and it isn't a picture of Joey. But that doesn't stop people turning up at the village hall to look for it, which I like. When the idea of War Horse was weaving itself inside my head and how to tell it, but there was a moment when I knew, I really knew that this book could be written. Here's how it happened. So one of these schools came down from Birmingham 25 odd years ago. A school that had been before, so I knew them. They turned up in the coach Friday afternoon in, in, uh, by the front door. And the teacher gets out of the coach and she beckons me over and says, Michael, do you see that boy who's getting off the coach? He's Billy. She says, whatever you do, don't point the finger at him. Don't ask him questions direct because he gets frightened. He could do a runner. He could run all the way back to Birmingham. And we don't want that, do we? So kind of don't ask him questions. There is a reason, Michael, and the reason is this. He's very sensitive, he's very nervous. He apparently has a huge stutter, but we haven't even heard him do that because he hasn't spoken at our school and he's been there two years. So I said, fine, no problem at all, no problem at all, and I didn't address any questions to him. And the week went on and I watched him around the farm. Yes, he was rather isolated, rather away from all the others, but he was having a good week. And then on the last night, which was a Thursday night, 
And I turned up in the yard and it was dark, November night. And I walked into this courtyard here and as I came into the courtyard I heard someone talking. And Billy was stood right by this stable here, talking to the horse. And talking 19 to the dozen. I mean his voice was just running on, the sentences were running on. He was have, it wasn't haltering, he wasn't stuttering, he was just talking. And I was amazed because I'd been told this, this story about him. So I ran around through the vegetable garden, back in the house, got the teachers, and we all came and looked and we stood there in the dark and witnessed this extraordinary sight of this boy standing there in his slippers, telling this horse, this boy who couldn't speak, had this terrible stutter, telling this horse about this wonderful day he'd had on the farm. I, it was one of the most moving moments of my life. And what it did, because I was already thinking about War Horse and the horse telling the story, it simply convinced me of how important the relationship could be between animals and people, particularly between horses and people. How they seem somehow to grow in each other's confidence, particularly when there's kindness around. And in this case, of course, particularly when it's a child that was concerned. And it gave me the confidence to think I can tell this story from the inside of a horse's head. And it wasn't ridiculous and that I could do it. So I wrote the book, book finished, final full stop, sent it off to my agent. Then there's this awful waiting moment. Will they, won't they, will they, won't they join my particular little literary dance? And I got lucky. A publisher called Kane Ward. Um, a publisher called Rosemary Debenham, who worked there, liked the book a lot, said she'd publish it. And I thought, yay, great, great, great. Uh, and I was very, very excited, because my first really long novel, and the first novel I thought was really any good. So the book was out there, in hardback, in paperback, but it didn't do very well. Anyway, some, some 20 years after publication, nearly 25 years after publication, um, I, I got a phone call from the National Theatre saying, they'd like to do a play of it. My first reaction was that I thought they were, the National Theatre were nutters because you can't make a play, I didn't think, of a, of a book like this, of two horses or one horse in particular in the First World War. How do you do that? It's simply beyond my imaginings. Uh, so I thought actually it would die the death and someone realises about horses and you couldn't do it, so there we are. And then it got serious and suddenly I was invited up to meet Tom Morris, who seemed very set on the idea and they were going to get a script writer and they were going to get a great director and then I heard news that they were going also to have these extraordinary puppeteers, handspring puppeteers from South Africa um, who had made and I was shown these extraordinary animals and could animate them with people inside in the most magical way and I began to believe maybe, maybe, maybe this could be really interesting. Mm -hmm.